Well, hello and welcome to this combined naval address on climate, energy, and environment. My name is Captain Andrea Cameron, and I'm a permanent military professor at the Naval War College and the director of the Climate and Human Security Group. Over the last four years, we at the Naval Academic Institutions have been building a network of faculty and students interested in climate and energy topics. This collaboration includes the Naval War College, the Naval Postgraduate School, the U.S. Naval Academy, Marine Corps University, and the Naval Community College. And we've had some exceptional national and international academics talk to us about energy innovation, climate communications, analyzing DOD emissions and Navy climate on energy and, and Navy policy on climate and energy. So today our talk is our eighth combined Naval address and it's on a very important topic, heat. To talk to us about heat is New York Times bestselling author, Jeff Goodell. I first met Jeff when he came to the Naval War College after he published his last book, The Water Will Come, Rising Seas, Sinking Cities and the Remaking of the Civilized World. And that book won the New York Times Critic Top Book Award in 2017. He's joining us today to talk about his latest book, The Heat Will Kill You First, Life and Death on a Scorched Planet. In all, he's written six previous books, and he's been a climate journalist covering climate change for more than two decades at Rolling Stone and discussing climate and energy issues on a variety of media sources like NPR, MSNBC, CNN, ABC, Fox News, and even the Oprah Winfrey Show. He was a 2016 New America Fellow and a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow. Now I'm gonna just briefly talk about the book because I really like his writing style. Uh, he, in general, has a, a writing approach that's a rolling narrative that really incorporates scientific background, personal stories of those affected, people who are finding solutions, uh, a, a long list of poetic analogies, <laughs> and he mixes it in with expert in interviews. And the other thing I really like about it is there's often a lot of aha moments when I read Jeff's work, because I find it very thought-provoking. So today we are going to change our format a little. Usually in a combined naval address, we let our expert kind of give a long presentation and then we ask a few questions. But today I'm gonna to do an interview of Jeff Goodell and incorporate our students along the way. So thanks for joining us. And I'm gonna just first turn it over to Jeff Goodell and just ask if he has any opening remarks for us. Well, hello, thank you uh, for, for that, Andrea. Um, I'm happy to be here uh, to talk to all of you. First thing I wanna say, and I will probably say a um, hundred more times, is that I'm, I'm sorry for the delay um, that I was, a, uh, we had to push this back an hour. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, um, doing some reporting for a story I'm doing for the New York Times about um, rebuilding after hurricanes. And uh, I had some things that I, 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 I couldn't skip. So, um, so I'm sorry, but I'm here, and we'll, I'm really looking forward to this um, conversation uh, over uh, the next hour or so. Um, I'm happy to talk about uh, as as this rolls out. I want you to know that I'm happy to talk about any aspect of this. I welcome all of your questions, whether they're about um, the science of climate change, the the science of heat in particular, of course, but also things about climate politics, um, about journalism, about writing, about media. Um, I'm really happy to uh, entertain um, any questions you have. And part of the reason I wanted to do this as an interview is to have kind of more flexibility and sort of be more dynamic in this conversation rather than me just giving um, a, a long talk um, about my book. So with that, let's go. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Again, the primary topic is your latest book, The Heat Will Kill You First, Life and Death on a Scorched Planet. Um, so I'm going to ask you some very basic questions. The first one is, what is heat? Because you give an excellent kind of layman's description of how our understanding of vibrating molecules has developed over time. So you can, can you start with, with the group today by explaining what heat in general is? Yeah, you know, and that's a really good place to start because um, uh, I want to make a confession here, which is that I was a climate journalist for 15 years um, before I understood what he was, uh, which is um, kind of remarkable because, you know, 
the, the phrase global warming suggests that heat is a big part of the story. Um, and yet um, it is not something that most people understand. Um, certainly I didn't as a journalist, I understood temperature. Uh, I understood how to um, measure heat, but I didn't understand what heat was. And so that was one of the things that actually motivated me to write the book. I'll talk more about that later. But, you know, heat is actually just, you know, a, a kind of vibration of molecules. That is when, when something is hotter, it means that the molecules are vibrating faster. It's a it's a form of energy. Right. And this was a um, subject of much debate in the 18th century during the sort of age of enlightenment. There was a lot of discussion about, you know, is heat you know, some kind of invisible ray that flows? Is it some kind of liquid that we can't see? You know, what exactly is it? And in my book, I, I talk a little bit about um, the, the process that went into kind of discovering that that it is vibration. And, you know, the important thing about thinking about about heat as vibration, I think, is to, is to think about it as, when I, in a hotter world, it means the sort of metabolism of the world is of things are is moving faster. It is a more active world. It is a more chaotic world, if you will, because you have you know stuff moving around, bouncing around more. Um, and so I, I think that as both as a scientific fact and as a sort of broader metaphor for you know when we think about life in a hotter world understanding that heat means motion it means that it means that your body and the bodies of all living things and all material things are moving faster is in a really important framework idea thanks i'm going to ask another kind of foundational question because um there's heat and then we experience this kind of in a heat wave. And then there's especially kind of how the jet stream will affect heat waves. So can you just sort of kind of take your description of heat and then say, well, what, how does that, these vibrating molecules kind of lead to a collection that is a heat wave? Well, okay, so heat waves are um, kind of an atmospheric phenomena, right? They are um, related to, um, uh, how the atmosphere is um, constructed at any particular moment. It has to do with heat waves often have to do with, you know, kind of trapping of uh, warm air over a certain location. Um, the air, uh, the ground warms up, warms uh, the, the, the air above the ground more. It, um, it tries to kind of rise as heat does. And because you have, this is where the phrase heat dome, for example, comes from. You have a, a kind of pressure zone above a region that keeps that heat from kind of escaping. Think You can think about it that way. And so this heat builds up underneath this atmospheric pressure. And so, so when you think of a heat wave, um, you can think of it as this sort of, you know, a, 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 almost like a lid over a region during a, you know, a hot period. And that's what... Um, exaggerates the the temperatures in this particular place over um, kind of another place. And one of the interesting things that's happening too is that you know we're getting more um, extreme heat waves in places that we didn't anticipate, right? So I write in my book about the the heat over um, the Pacific Northwest in 2021 when there was a um, a very dramatic heat wave there. Many of you, I'm sure remember it over Washington and Oregon and, and British Columbia, you know, a place where normal summers, and I, and I grew up in the in Northern California, so I experienced this myself, you know, normal summers are in the 70s and 80s, maybe on a hot day gets to the 90s. And we had, you know, two and a half weeks of temperatures in the, uh, you know, 115, 120, 121 degrees. And that was a devastating impact. There was about 700 people died and you had towns in Pacific Northwest that were essentially spontaneously combusting. Um, and the reason that happened is because as our atmosphere, as our, as our um, climate warms up, it's changing the atmospheric patterns in very complex ways <clears throat> that not only do I not completely understand, but even scientists who study them don't completely understand. But they do know that it's 
shifting the, the jet stream, which is the kind of atmospheric river of wind in the sky uh, in particular ways, changing the gradient of temperature between the Arctic and the equator that is causing these sort of what they what scientists describe as wiggles that that are allowing these sort of heat domes to accumulate in new and unusual places. So one of the hallmarks of our hotter, more chaotic climate is these kinds of, it's not just about, you know, heat waves and getting gradually warmer. It's about these new extreme events happening in unusual places that they have not happened in before. That's a great description. Um, and in general, we have a problem understanding heat and, and heat waves, and it's not very communicated very well. Uh, can you think of why we have this communication issue when we're talking about heat? Oh, I can talk for that, about that for a very long time. Um, well, first of all, you know, there's a problem in the use of in our language around heat, right? Um, Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook um, in his dorm room at Harvard uh, when he built a website called Hot or Not to rank the girls in the dorm and all the guys would get on it and rank the girls hot or not. Um, when you in are in college, um, or maybe even in the Naval Academy, um, uh, and you go out and you meet someone attractive, you might tell a friend or something that he or she is hot. So in our language is built this um, ambiguity and complexity about what the word heat means, right? So there's there's that. There's also the problem of most of us, not all of us, and but a lot of people, we like warmer weather, right? So we, we, you know, more people would rather, I think, hang out on a beach on a warm day in flip-flops than hang out in, you know, the, the, the northern plains on a um, frigid winter day in, in, you know, snow boots and a big parka. So our, our natural inclination is to think, oh, it's warm. Let's go to the beach. It's a good thing. Let's relax. So there's all of this kind of cross signaling around it. And then you add on top of that the way the media deals with this, right? When, the, when a heat wave is coming, right now I'm in Asheville, you know, writing about the aftermath of a hurricane. We just had, as everyone knows, a massive hurricane that just hit Florida. You know, the images of that are very dramatic. You see, you know, the media puts up pictures of houses that are blown into different, you know, uh, uh, you know, on top of each other, trees that are uprooted, you know, cars upside down, people getting out of their apartments in canoes, all that kind of stuff. In heat waves, the media often shows people at the beach or kids playing in sprinklers and they don't communicate it. And, and there's a reason for that. It's because unlike a hurricane, which is a very dramatic event, it's like, made, it's like a made for TV event. It's like Steven Spielberg, you know, orchestrating the weather. Heat waves are invisible. You know, I sit at home in Austin, in Texas, where I live, and I look out the window and I can't tell if it's 70 degrees outside or 120 degrees outside. I can tell as soon as I open my door and step outside, but I cannot tell by looking at it. And so there's all these conf confusing kind of cognitive signals around heat that makes it very difficult for us to really get the message about how dangerous it is. You, you explain a lot about the, the basics of heat. And then when you take this and you look at the planet as a whole, you kind of break it out and talk about the goalie, old Goldilocks zone. You, you use that framing throughout the whole book. What does the Goldilocks zone mean? So I think the Goldilocks zone is one of the most important ideas in my book. And I think that, you know, if sometimes people ask me, what are the two or three kind of biggest takeaways that I hope people kind of um, take away from, from my book. And I think the Goldilocks zone is certainly one of them. Um, it's, a, it's a phrase that I stole from or borrowed maybe um, from um, scientists who are looking for life on other planets. Um, uh, when they are surveying these exoplanets, they're looking for the presence of liquid water, which is a, seen as a kind of precursor for life. And planets that are too cold are of course balls of ice and planets that are too hot uh, uh, there's no water because everything has evaporated. They're looking for planets with water, which they call the planets in the Goldilocks zone. 
And this idea is really important in thinking about um, the consequences of extreme heat and about the consequences of life on a hotter planet in general, which is that, you know, you and me and everyone you know, and every living thing from grasshoppers to redwood trees, we've all evolved to thrive in a certain range of temperatures. Um, those temperatures can vary on from different species. Um, the, the, you know, um, bacteria that thrive in the hot springs in, in, um, in Yellowstone uh, can survive really hot temperatures. Um, you know, creatures that thrive in the Arctic can thrive in very cold temperatures, but they all have a range. And we humans have a range also. And, you know, obviously we can do things because we're intelligent creatures. We can do things like invent air conditioning and have developed various tools to help us adapt. But our actual range of temperatures that we can thrive in is very narrow. And the reason this is important for thinking about extreme heat and for thinking about this book is that as our world gets hotter, we're moving out of the Goldilocks zone. That's a very useful way of thinking about climate change and its impact on all living things. And for that matter, on, on infrastructure and other things too. Um, you know, our, as many people know, on hot days, you know, sometimes planes can't land because the tarmac is soft. Um, the lift changes uh, uh, on, a, on a plane when the air is hotter. They need longer runways and things like that. Uh, you know, this summer you have bridges that, that, that are sort of swinging bridges that swing to allow ship traffic to go through. Um, we're, we're, we're malfunctioning because the metal expands. Everything about us and our world is built for this particular range of temperatures. And now what we're doing by heating up the, the planet the way we are is we're moving out of the Goldilocks zone. And that has um, enormous implications um, which we can talk more about, but I think that you can um, see for yourself if you, you know, when you think about it for a few minutes, but it's a very useful um, concept, I think, for framing this discussion. Now I'm gonna incorporate a question I received from one of our students over at the Naval Postgraduate School, Captain Clayton Brock, and he wanted to know what drove your motivation to write this book. Well, you know, most books, um, this is my seventh book. Most books come out of a sort of muddy, hazy, you know, uh, ruminations. What's important? What's not? What do I feel like? They're, 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 I, I think on all of my other books, I couldn't really tell you exactly, you know, where they, where they came from. Um, I can speculate, but they don't have a moment of birth. This book had a moment of birth. This book happened in June of 2018, uh, I happened to be in Phoenix, Arizona on a hot day. And um, uh, I was not there for anything to do with heat. I was there um, to work on a different climate story. And there was a scientist there that um, I needed to talk to. And as usual, like today, I was late. Um, and uh, my Uber, I tried to call an Uber and my Uber wouldn't get there in time. So I decided the meeting was about 20 blocks away that I would run to the meeting. And um, it was, uh, I think, 116, 115, 16 degrees or something like that that day. And um, I didn't even really think about it. I just took off and I went about 10 blocks and became really dizzy, really lightheaded, uh, felt like I was going to pass out. And I just had this, you know, understanding that, you know, wow, if I had to do this another 10 blocks, this could kill me. Uh, this was really brutal. And it sounds insane. I had been writing about climate change for, you know, 15 years that it, that it had never occurred to me that he could be that immediately dangerous uh, to me and to other people. But, you know, sometimes you need events like that to kind of get it through your, your thick skull, kind of what's at stake. And, and that's, that was the moment for me. And I realized if I don't understand how dangerous he is, and I'm like a climate journalist, then I bet a lot of other people don't understand how dangerous heat is either. And so that 
that moment was like, maybe I should write a book about this. That's great. And I really, uh, the, I always know choosing the title of a book is, is an adventure in itself. Um, so the heat will kill you first, life and death on a scorched planet. Um, why was that the title that was selected? <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, in a certain way, it comes out of the experience I just I just mentioned. But, um, you know, I started the book and as some books do um, with just a kind of generic title when I, you know, sold the book to my publisher, Little Brown, the generic title was just Heat. And the idea was always that we'll come up with a better title later. And um, so I worked on the book for three years. And at a certain point, you know, maybe a year before publication, my editor said, okay, we got to get serious about a title. We can't just call it Heat. You know, first of all, Michael Mann has made great movies about that, called with that title. And also it's just boring and like, we need something better. And so I came up with, a bunch of titles. I gave them a list of 15 or so. They were all really lame, things like The Sword in the Sky and just really bad stuff. And he was like, okay, Jeff, we need some ideas. And then he showed me, had, had some ideas also, and they were all equally lame. And then one day I woke up in the middle of the night basically and said, oh, I know, the heat will kill you first. Because um, I really wanted to exaggerate in the title and challenge in the title um, that this is, you know, about you and, and your immediate life. Because I think that so much writing and thinking about climate change is about future generations, you know, the world you are going to leave to your kids, you know, people who live on the other side of the planet that you're never going to see who are vulnerable, you know, ice sheets far away, you know, just that it's very abstract. And, and I really wanted to give it a kind of immediacy. So I emailed my editor one morning. I said, I got the title, I got the title. And I sent it to him and he immediately called me. He, my phone rang immediately and he said, Jeff, that is not the title of the book. That is, no one is going to buy a book like that. That's a terrible title. It's scary. It'll put everybody off. And I made the pitch about why I really wanted to call it that. And I convinced him. And then he said, no, I'll ne well, I'll never convince anybody else here because they all hate it too. Um, but then he and I fought for it and basically came down to, okay, if you want to hang yourself uh, by naming your book this, go ahead, we'll, we'll sign on. And, you know, I mean, obviously you can judge for yourself whether you think it's a good title or not, but um, I like it. I think it's provocative. I think it really communicates instantly the message that I really want to give in the book, which is, as I said, this is not about far away, distant things. This is about you and your life and the people you love and the people around you and you know the danger of of this and and um the title kind of provokes you to think about it that way immediately i'm going to ask uh, kind of i think the question you get asked most often especially when you write a provocative book like this um will places become uninhabitable and we have kind of a question in in the chat here you know, what do you consider kind of the temperature ranges for humans to live in? And I think that's the same question. Um, when you think about heat, is is being uninhabitable or unlivable kind of a concern you have? Um, well, certainly it's a it's a it's a huge concern. But the question about um, you know what's inhabitable and what's not inhabitable is um, far more complex than um, it first appears, right? So. Obviously, if you are kind of, you know, naked in the desert, um, there's a certain range of temperatures that, you know, you can't, if it's, you know, you have a very narrow range of temperatures that you that you can survive in. I mean, you know, uh, anything above 125 degrees or something with direct sunlight. It also depends on how much humidity there is. There's a lot of factors, but there's a clear threshold of what our bodies can deal with. But in the real world, this question that people ask is much more complicated because, first of all, um, who is we, right? So, I mean, Elon Musk could, could do fine on Mars, right? I mean, he could spend, you know, a couple of billion dollars, build some crazy thing and have people, you know, flying back and forth to Mars with whatever he needs and he, he, he could figure it out, right? Uh, I mean, obviously... A little joking here, but in, in theory, someone like, you know, people who are well off can thrive in all kinds of conditions. 
Um, if you have access to air conditioning, if you have access to, if you're mobile, um, there, there's a lot of conditions that um, separate someone like that from, you know, someone who lives in, uh, you know, a shack in Delhi, uh, like I talked to and met um, a few months ago when I was in India, who have no access to air conditioning, who are not mobile, who have outdoor work in markets or, or in sweatshops and can't afford to miss a day because if they miss a day, they can't do without that money to feed their family. So the range of vulnerability is very, very different. So yes, yeah, so Phoenix is a great example. People always ask about Phoenix and because the book was born there and it's because it's you know emblematic of a, uh, a, a, a modern city that is also in the middle of a hot zone that, um, has a lot of climate challenges having to do with water and things like that too. So, you know, it's not, it's not like in 10 years, Phoenix is going to get too hot to live. Right. I mean, we have air, you have buildings with air conditioning, air conditioning in Phoenix. I think there's a 98% um, penetration of air conditioning, but that doesn't mean that everything is okay. Cause there's still tens of thousands of people in a place like Phoenix who, or even more than that, who, who either don't have air conditioning or more often can't afford to run it more than, you know, an hour or two a day because it's so expensive. These people are incredibly vulnerable. Um, there's also this question, like I live in Austin, Texas. I moved there seven years ago into the kind of belly of the climate beast. And it's very hot there too. And, you know, obviously I'm okay. Uh, although I will confess that I did thought for a while, I thought I would do an experiment of writing this book without air conditioning, just to, you know, kind of, I thought it'd be an interesting kind of frame for the book. And that lasted about three days. Um, so I'm very aware of the importance of air conditioning, but I'm also very aware of like, you know, we had 40 days over 105 degrees last summer. And, you know, I lived this vampire life where you know you i got up at five in the morning and go for a walk or go for a bike ride or do whatever i wanted to do huddle in my air-conditioned bubble all day and then um you know, maybe go out at night again and if i had to go out in the middle of the day you know you basically have to put gloves on to touch the steering wheel and of your car if you walk to the mailbox you know you feel like you're taking your life in your hands i mean there's this question of, do you want to live that way? Like, so I think that a lot of people will begin to move out of places like that and decide, I don't want to live that way. So the, the complicated answer to this simple question is, you know, the question of, will it get too hot? Yes, it's already too hot for some people. And no, it won't get too hot for some people because they have all the means of adapting to it. Um, but it is going to have an impact and it, I would argue, already is having an impact on sort of where we live. And then I, I won't even go into all the sort of the knock-on effects of what it means for food supply in certain regions, how it's changing migration patterns. Uh, disease patterns are really important. You know, um, there, there's a whole bunch of other effects that um, I haven't even brought up. Uh, so anyway. That's my I well, hope we'll get to well, some of those questions. I, I'm going to follow up on this because um, what you call it the sweat economy, you know, how some people can live in the bubble of cool air and then other, but there's a lot of jobs that are out in, in, in the heat. And we in the military, we often find ourselves having to do our training, our exercises, our basic operations, also potentially exposed to this heat. Um, what are the long-term impacts of, of kind of heat exposure and what can we do if we are Part of this sweat economy? Well, um, first of all, I want to say that <clears throat> some of the um, best research on heat and some of the most helpful researchers that I talked to for my book were all in the military um, because they and you understand these risks and do have to operate in hot places. Um, and don't have the luxury of doing what I do, which is just like retreat to an air conditioned bubble, right? I mean, heat is a very real risk um, in the field and something that um, the military has been studying and has been aware of for a, a very long time. Uh, 
And so what you can do about it, you know, that's, that's the big question, right? So there's a million things that we could talk about. I mean, you know, access, but it all comes down to access to cooling. Um, uh, you know, there's no, there's no pill you can take um, that will protect you from extreme heat. There's no, um, uh, e there's no easy remedy, you know? I mean, there's, I get a call once a week from an entrepreneur who has some kind of cooling vest from some, from some new chemical process that they're invented that they think they're gonna sell millions of. And and I, I know the military is working on kind of cooling devices, personal cooling devices. So, so there are things like that, right, that are, that are important. Um, but ultimately it comes down to getting out of the heat. I mean, there's no, there's no way to, um, to, to think about this otherwise. There's no pharmaceutical fix. There's no, you know, one of the things I try to disabuse people of when I, in, you know, normal uh, book talks is, um, you know, that if you're overheated because you're on a hike outdoors or you're working outside and you're feeling like you're kind of, you know, getting into dangerous heat zone, you're feeling heat exhaustion or something even worse, closer to heat stroke, you know, taking Tylenol is not going to help. It is not the same thing as a fever, right? The only solution is to get your um, body core temperature down. Um, there was a really interesting report uh, that CBS News did a month or so ago, which is not in my book, but is a really great example of this, is that um, um, ambulance drivers who, who um, throughout, the, they did a study of like 25 um, cities, when they come across people who are suffering from extreme heat, um, what they would normally do was, you know, find them passed out or whatever the conditions they're in and put them in the ambulance and take them to the hospital. But the problem is that's 20 or 30 minutes where their body is still really hot and they haven't cooled off and there's nothing they thought that, you know, there was no right treatment for them. But then a number of doctors figured out that like, no, the way to treat someone who had severe heat exposure is not to put them in an ambulance and take them to the hospital as fast as possible. It's to, you know, uh, respond to the call, the ambulance or the paramedics or whoever, but then immediately pack them in ice right there and don't transport them until you've got them packed in ice and have this cooling um, going on in their body. Because when your body is overheating, every minute that your body is um, at this higher, your inner, internal core temperatures at this higher rate, you're doing physical damage, long-term damage to your body. And that gets to the second part of the question is what are the longer term consequences? And, and you know, that is still something that is um, under active exploration. Um, there's, there's, you know, I, I think it's fair to say, certainly based on my research that it, other than a number of, a couple of researchers maybe more than a couple a dozen or whatever the number is researchers in the military, some people who um, uh, some sports researchers around, especially around football, because there've been a couple of notable deaths from extreme heat at, at football games. Uh, have, have, people have not taken the risks of extreme heat very seriously and the consequences of extreme heat seriously. That field has exploded in the last four or five years. Um, partly because of climate change and the fact, the understanding that we that we are living in this you know, a much hotter world and we need to understand better what the consequences are. But one of the things, you know, we know, for example, is uh, kidney damage, right? Because um, we've seen that in sugarcane workers in South America, for example, there have been a number of really good studies on that. And that's because, you know, they're working hard in the heat. They're drinking a tremendous amount of water in order to stay hydrated as they're working. And that water gets, you know, filtered through their kidneys, which make, basically means their kidneys are working three or four times, <coughs> sorry, harder than, you know, yours and mine are who are sitting in our air conditioned bubbles. So it puts extreme stress on their kidneys and the incidence of, chronic kidney disease is much higher among these um, sugarcane workers than they are in the control populations. So that's one thing that we're seeing. You know, there's also a, a burgeoning field of 
uh, uh, understanding of heat impacts on the psychological process. Um, on um, uh, studies like uh, marital conflict, um, uh, suicide rates. Um, uh, you know, I think we all know anecdotally that on hot days we get cranky. Um, uh, I, it was amusing to me. I, I was just um, in the plane coming here to Asheville. I've just started reading uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, um, just <clears throat> as a fun read. Uh, and the first, in its office, it's about, I think most of you might know, it's about a murder. It's about a 19th century Russian novel about a guy who commits murder and the psychological consequences of that. But the very first line of the book is, it was a really hot day in St. Petersburg, Russia. I mean, it begins with heat as, it's almost as if Dostoevsky in 1863 understood that heat was a influencing factor on this murder he's about to describe. So there's a lot of, you know, work on that being done, you know, really interesting studies coming out showing, for example, that in schools that are unair conditioned compared to schools that are air conditioning, air conditions, test scores are 10 to 12 percent lower. Um, so the impairment of cognitive function is a big issue uh, when it when it comes to heat. Those are some great examples. Um, we have a question from Captain Angelica Ramirez from the Naval Postgraduate School. And she's interested in kind of what policies we can make, and not just we, the United States, but around the world, that could kind of give extreme heat the respect it deserves and focus not just on saving lives, but perhaps kind of what can we economically incentivize to change our heat policies? Well, economically incentivized, so that's interesting. Um, you know, it's interesting because, again, speaking of sort of new understandings about heat, the economics of, uh, the economic costs of extreme heat is something that is um, really emerging in the last few years in a number of studies. The loss of productivity um, as people basically slow down on hot days. Um, I mean, I see that anecdotally in the heat of the summer in, in Austin, you know, restaurants are closed. Nobody wants to sit outside. Nobody wants to go anywhere. They do what I do, which is, you know, sit around in their air conditioned bubble and, um, and, and don't go to, don't do the usual things that they would do. Um, outdoor workers have to work shorter days. Um, you know, there's a, a whole suite of economic consequences that go along with um, life in a hotter world. And those costs are huge. The Federal Reserve Bank um, of Texas, which is hardly a tree hugger organization, estimated that the economic damages just in Texas uh, to the um, hot summer we had in 2023 was $30 billion in, in lost productivity as a result of, of heat for these, for these reasons. But at the same time, so so at the same time as we had that uh, as that study came out around about that summer, you know, we have a governor in Texas, Greg Abbott, who decided in the middle of this really hot summer that he was going to sign legislation prohibiting any city or county in Texas from giving um, mandating any water or shade breaks for workers, um, because in his view that would. You know, he didn't want them basically sitting around in the shade um, drinking water when they should be working, which is the exact opposite of, you know, what you would do if you were really concerned about the welfare and productivity of, of workers. So, you know, you have these sort of cross-cutting currents in American politics and in how we think about this. And I think that, um, you know, how we learn to work in a hotter world is a, a really big issue. And, you know, how, I mean, is it, for example, again, you know, there's been a, a lot of focus on um, uh, warehouse workers and um, delivery workers um, for a long time, or until a year or two ago, you know, UPS and FedEx many of their vehicles were not um, air conditioned. And so they had a, a large number of workers who were passing out, accidents happening, um, 
and even a number, uh, uh, several deaths as a result of extreme heating, these sort of delivery vehicles. Same with, you know, warehouses. And because part of the reason is, you know, there was this idea that, oh, we don't need air conditioning. You know, it's like, why do we need air conditioning? You know, just roll down the windows. It's too expensive. We don't, we don't want to spend the money for air conditioning. And now I think that, you know, uh, corporations and others are realizing that the money spent on air conditioning is money well spent because um, of the you know increases in, in in productivity among workers who are sort of cool um, and, and can actually have the kind of conditions um, in which they can optimize their sort of you know working. You've given several great examples. I'm going to pull a quote from Heather McTeer-Tony. She was the former mayor of Greenville, Mississippi, and she was testifying before Congress. So you include this quote in your book. She said, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Some of us are sitting in aircraft carriers while others are just bobbing along on a floaty. End quote. So first, I love the nautical reference. Second, uh, can you comment on kind of her key idea? You've given some examples already, but how does a feat, uh, heat affect segments of society differently? Well, I mean, that, I love that quote, too. And uh, I, as soon as I read it, I thought, OK, this goes in the book. Um, uh, you know, this goes back to what I said about Elon Musk could do fine on Mars, right? I mean, the, the, our adaptive capacities and our ability to kind of whether this is different for for everyone it doesn't mean that you know we're not all at risk and you know i opened the book with a story about a family who goes for a for a hike in california they're young they have their one and a half year old child with them they're uh healthy they're outdoorsy people and they happen to get uh on a uh, steep trail uh on a really hot day with no shade and and long story short, they all end up dead. And you can read the, the details of the story. But the reason I open the book with that story is that on one level, you know, we're all vulnerable in the wrong conditions. So the idea that, you know, even Elon, you know, if, if he's like, if his Tesla breaks down in the Mojave Desert on a hot day, and there's nobody around, and he can't call in his helicopter, you know, um, he's in trouble. So, you know, in the wrong circumstances, we're all in trouble. But I think that this, what the quote you read really is the, one of the other key takeaways of this book is that I call heat a, a predatory force. And, and it really is. It goes after the most vulnerable first. And we're not all in the same boat. We don't all have access to air conditioning. There are 750 million people on this planet who do not even have access to electricity much less air conditioning. So the notion that like, whoa, I mean, I get this a lot, like, oh, yeah, you wrote a book about heat. Oh, uh, you know, I know that's, I, I hate it too, but luckily, you know, we invented air conditioning, so problem solved. Well, no, the problem is not solved for, you know, a, a wide variety of reasons, among them, the fact that people don't have even access to electricity, the fact that many people who have air conditioning have a broken air conditioner or, and they, that they can't afford to fix or they can't afford the electricity costs of it. So, you know, we're not all in this. We're all in, in, in different sized boats. You know, if you're a 22 year old marathoner, you know, you're going to be, you know, much more resilient to heat than if you're um, a 75 year old man with coronary artery disease. Um, you know, someone like that is extremely vulnerable to, um, to heat. Um, so I think that that's really important when you think about shaping policy and when you think about how do we begin to structure a world, whether it's within the military or more broadly within our society in general, that, you know, tries to protect people. Who do you protect? How do you focus your resources? Who, who do you how do you make it so that uh, when you have a heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, 800 people don't die in 48 hours? You know, um, are we just going to accept this kind of loss? Is that just going to be part of the fact of living on a hotter planet? Is that, you know, we're going to have these sort of, you know, mass heat deaths during during heat waves? Is Is heat going to become this sort of culling force in our world? Or are we going to be 
sort of actively engaged in trying to do what we can to protect the most vulnerable. Now you've talked a lot about heat waves on land, um, but can you describe a, a marine heat wave and what are the consequences? So you list so many of them in your book, the Pacific in um, 2013, Mediterranean in 2012, 15, 17, and 22, New Zealand in 2018, Uruguay in 2021. You just mentioned another one. Um, one of your quotes was these marine heat waves are driving a massive reorganization of underwater life with many creatures migrating to cooler waters. Um, but you also described kind of a long chain of effects. Can you describe the overall impact of marine heat waves? Well, I mean, you know, that's a great subject and one that is very close to my heart. Um, so, I mean, let's start with the idea that 90% of the additional heat that is accumulated, you know, because of you know, the higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, the, in the greenhouse gases, um, goes into the ocean. It's the big heat sink for our planet. And so um, the ocean is heating up, is, is kind of the big flywheel of, of, um, of extreme heat. And for most Americans, obviously not for people on this call, but for not most Americans, for most people, who are not like living literally on the shore and on the coast, and even some of those who do, the you know the ocean is a vast world that they know nothing about and don't really care about, right? I mean that's you know they're, they're trying to talk with a audience even among the self-selected people who read my book and come to my talks, they never ask me about the oceans. They ask me about all kinds of things. But the question that you just asked, I, I've probably given 150 book talks uh, since my book was published all around the world. And I don't think once this question has come up, which is emblematic of something, right? And, and but the consequences are so extreme, right? Because of, um, you know, as we, as it gets, as the oceans get hotter, the, just like I described the jet stream in the sky moving and changing around, um, currents are changing in the ocean, which is has enormous in fact impacts on on temperatures. And just like every other creature on the planet, uh, life in the ocean has a Goldilocks zone. So so when the temperatures change in the ocean, um, they people uh, creatures, living things have to either move or die. Right? There's no other thing. You get out of your Goldilocks zone, you're dead. And for some um, fish, for example, you know, sharks are being seen in new places. They're very mobile. They're able to move around. Um, that's changing. You know, might be freaking out people in Maine to see a great white in Maine or something. But, you know, th that's just emblematic of the kind of mobility that we're seeing in, in, um, in ocean species. But, it, you know, if you're... Uh, a coral on the Great Barrier Reef or on any other reef for that matter, you can't just, um, you know, kind of pick up and and sort of move along to, to migrate to a new place. And so you have these incredibly important um, ecological structures like Great Barrier Reef or like like coral reefs in general. And, and I've spent... I've been diving at the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs a lot, and I and I I have a very um, I think they're just you know these incredible um, you know uh, natural wonders that I I just you know one of the everybody has their things that like hits them hardest when in, when we talk about you know the sort of losses that we're facing as our world warms up, and for me seeing you know going to the Barrier Reef. Uh, and having a spectacular dive and going back to the exact same spot eight years later and seeing it bleached out in white was really um, heartrending. But, you know, it's not just about aesthetics or about like that. It's, you know, as everyone knows, the reefs are the sort of nurseries of, of a lot of species in the ocean. And as we lose reefs, um, that's just one example of the consequences of, of a warming ocean. You know, and another example is um, the one thing I do get asked about that is, that is tangentially 
well, not tangentially, directly in the book related to the ocean, but not in the people who asked the questions mind, is they asked me, why did you go to Antarctica to write a book about heat? And like, why would you go to a cold place like that? And the reason I, I went, and I went on a um, research vessel um, uh, for a seven-week cruise to um, the West Antarctica Ice Sheet, which was a, a, an incredible journey that um, uh, I, I could talk about in more detail, but I don't, the, the main point I want to make is that we went there to look at the destabilization of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, which is a, an ice sheet about the size of Florida. Uh, and that um, if it falls apart, um, would contribute about 10 feet of sea level rise. And there's a lot of scientific concern about what's happening with this ice sheet and more specifically this one glacier called Thwaites Glacier, which I memorably named the Doomsday Glacier and has have gotten uh, endless amount of infamy, grief, and praise for, for that. But um, the, the important point is all of this destabilization of West Antarctica, all of this stuff that that is um, consuming a lot of scientists right now and is has enormous implications for every coastal city in the world is because the Southern Ocean is basically warmed up about one degree. One degree of warming, maybe a little bit more now, um, has is enough that it is destabilizing the West Antarctic ice sheet because it's just enough so that the little bit warmer water can melt these, uh, this ice sheet from underneath. And because of the way the Antarctic continent is shaped, once this warm water, a little bit warmer water melts and can get over this lip where the West Antarctic ice sheet sits, it can then kind of basically flow downhill down underneath the rest of, of the ice sheet. And so what's happening in Antarctica is the ice sheet is basically melting from below and destabilizing from below. It's like pulling bricks out of a foundation uh, when you have a house standing. And you know you can pull out a few bricks and no big deal, but at a certain point, if you keep pulling the bricks out, the whole house is gonna fall down. And that's very different than what's happening in, in the Arctic. When in the Arctic, you have surface melting. You, the, the melting that's happening up there is because you have warmer air that is melting the ice from above. That's why you have these, you know, rivers of runoff, these moulins and things like that. You have these calving of these glaciers in a very, it's very obvious to anybody who looks at Greenland, what's going on. There's a lot of questions about the rate and pace of it, but it's very obvious. In Antarctica, that's not the case at all. There's no, sur for all intents and purposes, no surface melting. If you look at it from the air, it looks the same as it did 50 years ago or 100 years ago or whatever. And it wasn't until about a decade ago that scientists understood, no, this place is really destabilizing. And it's, and it's de destabilizing underneath. And it's because of a tiny change in the warmth of the Southern Ocean. And to me, that's a, a, a great example of why the ocean matters so much and, and why you know, it's not just extreme temperatures that we need to think about. Even small changes in temperatures in the, in the kind of right or wrong places have enormous implications. Thanks, Jeff. I couldn't uh, resist representing all the naval educational institutions not having a question about the oceans. Yeah. Now, I'd like to go uh, to Troy Christensen. He works at FEMA. He just graduated the Naval Postgraduate School, finished his thesis on extreme heat and received an outstanding thesis award. So, Troy, would you like to ask a question to Jeff? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I found, Jeff, in, in my research and, and also reading your book is, um, you know, so many stakeholders have to, have to be brought, brought to the table for this issue. I mean, it's public health, health, it's critical infrastructure, it's everything in between. So I, I'm wondering from your perspective, uh, you know, what you believe are the most effective ways to foster through this collaboration, knowing when you talk about extreme heat mitigation strategies and things of that nature? Well, that's a great question and a true question and a difficult question. Um, you know, because first of all, I don't think there's any one answer. I, I think that, you know, it's different in Austin, Texas than it is in Paris, France. And, um, um, you know, so I hesitate about about that, 
I also hesitate because, you know, I, my gift is that, um, basically telling stories. Uh, I think of myself as a storyteller. I don't think of myself as a political activist or as a political scientist even. And so kind of what the best methods and technology, not technologies, but um, uh, how, how, how to bring together, I mean, what you're really talking about is the kind of political will. I mean, this collaboration requires, um, first of all, an agreement of, of what's at stake, right? It requires an agreement that something needs to be done about this. And then the question is, okay, so what do we do? And so all each one of those steps is very difficult um, in, in every city, every place that I know. And, and um, especially in with it, with something like heat, because it, as I mentioned in the you know, opening of this talk, it's invisible. It's not like, what we're seeing in Florida, we're like, oh my God, you know, no one's going to ever invest in Florida again, or our real estate is in huge trouble if we don't look like we're, you know, or if we don't respond to this, if we don't think differently about this. I think it's, you know, after events like this, you see a lot of conversations about changing building codes, and there's a lot of political inertia behind change. And I would argue it doesn't last very long, and the changes don't don't, don't really catch on as much as they do, but I would, they, there is incremental progress. It's much harder on heat because, you know, you don't see it in that same way. Um, it, it preys on, as I've you know mentioned a number of times, this sort of predatory force idea that, so the people who are dying from extreme heat are people who in general are not political donors. You know, they're, they're not people who, are writing in the media every day and saying, what the hell is going on? How can you, you know, we got to do something about this. Um, they're the sort of, um, you know, the, the vulnerable people of our society who, who are the most voiceless. And so it requires real political leadership. It requires real consensus building. And frankly, you know, it's, it requires a lot of education because, you know, here I am, a climate journalist who five years ago didn't even know the risks of extreme heat. And so I go back to this thing that if I didn't know about it, then um, I think a lot of other people don't also. So it's very difficult to build consensus and collaboration around a risk and a problem that a lot of people don't even really understand and then is invisible. And then, you know, very few politicians are going to get, you know, um, praise or, you know, feel like they're going to become, you know, reelected by um, pushing forward and pushing hard on, on an issue like this. You know, I, I, but I do think it plays into a lot of other things like, you know, creation of green spaces in, in urban areas, um, uh, economics, efficiency, you know, the idea that if you have a white roof on your house, your air conditioning bill will be a lot cheaper. Um, um, there's a lot of sort of economic motion in that direction. And, and of course, in this whole talk, we have not touched yet on the, uh, on the emissions part of it, right? The, the reason that our planet is getting hotter is because we're continuing to burn fossil fuel. And it's going to continue to get hotter until we stop doing that. And then when we stop doing that, when we get to the mythical zero, net zero emissions, which, you know, there's a target of 2050, um, uh, which call me a little cynical that we'll reach that. But even if we do, and I hope I'm wrong, then all that will do is, is stop the warming. It won't take us back, right? We'll, we'll still be a hotter planet. So you know, part of the strategy of, of dealing with heat, and I know this is kind of beyond what your question, but I want to make sure that in the big picture I mentioned this is, you know, getting serious about emissions reductions and really getting serious about getting off of fossil fuels and the other things that are, you know, contributing to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but primarily fossil fuels, because until we do that, we're just we're just increasing the problem. We're just going to be getting worse and worse and worse. These storms that we're seeing uh, today or yesterday 
in Florida, you know, right, this rapid acceleration, uh, these, this uh, sort of larger scale that we're seeing are all the consequences of a hotter ocean. It's because the Gulf is three degrees hotter than, you know, typical at, at this time of year. And that's because, of, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the ocean is the heat sink and, and that heat is being absorbed uh, in, in places like the Gulf, which are, you know, basically becoming hot tubs. And these kind of, they're going, they're becoming hurricane factories. And, and um, so all this destructiveness is just going to continue to ramp up until we get serious about cutting emissions. And so I just, I know that's beyond what you asked about, but I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to really underscore that point. Yeah, I have at least uh, another hour's worth of questions for you, but I will ask my final one with a, a quick comment and, and a question. Uh, you, you did introduce a little cynicism there, but in general, I, I consider you kind of an optimist and you have a positive outlook. And my final question to you is because we have uh, an audience today with uh, so many future leaders, current and future leaders. If you could give them kind of one takeaway to think about with respect to climate change and heat, what would it be? Uh, I think the, the one takeaway would be that this is a moment of tremendous opportunity. Um, it goes to the old cliche about, you know, uh, you know opportunity in, in crisis, but um, it's really true here. I mean, um, I've been writing about climate change, you know, for more than 20 years. I often get asked, like, why am I not living in the basement? You know, like, scrawling on the wall with crayons about the lost world for my children, you know, and just, you know, drinking bourbon instead of out here, you know, writing books and, and talking to people like you. And, and it's because I, I am an optimist. I really, I, I think this is an, the, the most exciting thing that's happening in the world. I think that we're in the middle of this civilizational transformation that is going to change where we live, how we get our energy, the kind of food that we eat, um, you know, our, our culture, our economics, all of this stuff is going to be transformed by climate change. And we can do it badly in the kind of Mad Max way, or we can do it intelligently and use it as an opportunity to build a better world. And I really do think that, that like, you know, I drive around Austin and, you know, strip mall after strip mall, I'm you know, 27 lane highways. And I'm like, okay, this is not like optimal way of organizing human society on the planet. There are other ways of doing it better. And this is an opportunity to rethink about that. And so the thing that inspires me is that I meet so many amazing people who are doing, have, who, who understand this and are, have, you know, are fighting hard for this vision, whether they're you know, engineers who are working on solar panels or a better solar panels or transmission guys who are complete, you know, transmissions nerds that uh, you know, speak a language that I only vaguely understand, or whether they're 18 year old kids who are marching on the streets that they're uh, marching on their campuses, or, you know, um, other writers or neighborhood activists or food researchers. It's just, it's just like, an, I grew up in Silicon Valley, you know, I knew Steve Jobs and and when he was spouting Bob Dylan lyrics and running around barefoot. And, and this is like that. This is this moment of like, of like total transformation. And all you need to do is sort of shift your lens a little bit. You know, it's important to understand the scope and scale of the risks we face, because if you don't understand that, then you can't really think accurately about the scope and scale of the solutions that are out there. But if you do and you and you shift your your lens just a little bit, you see this amazing world of opportunity. It's just incredible. I think there's so much possibility, whatever your interest is, whether it's in finance, whether it's in boat building, whether it's in um, you know uh, food science, whether it's in um, urban planning, it's just like this blossoming world of opportunity. And I think that's the most important thing to take away. On that wonderful, empowering, and optimistic note, I'd like to express my deep thanks to Jeff Goodell for speaking with us today at this combined Naval Address. I'd also like to thank the Naval War College events, audiovisual, and PAO team, especially Charla, Charla Fiore, uh, for her support of the event. 
And this will conclude the recorded portion of the event. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.